We have a very good forensic science program. Um, I take forensic science students. Unsurprisingly, they don't really care about materials. They want to do forensics. So we started there looking at Raman, and we've been looking at trace evidence um, and drying horse blood because it's easier and safer with students. And we also got into heritage science. There's a lot of work come out of Kent that looked at the Mary Rose um, and preservation and conservation of the Mary Rose. And we've been involved in looking at some of the materials that are growing in the bricks. And that kind of led us down this road to Raman spectroscopy for alternative techniques. Um, one of the projects that we got into was for sports doping. We're a division of natural sciences. And over coffee, I got talking to a sports scientist who said it'd be really nice if we could test on site for effectively biomarkers. And this naturally left, led us to biomarkers. So first off, I thought I'd give you a little bit of an insight into what Raman is or what Raman can do. Um, anyway, what you have is instant light coming in, typically a laser. It interacts with your substrate and you get some form of scattered light. That leads to mostly elastic scattering, so what we call Raleigh scattering, where we get promoted from one state to a virtual state, and when we fall down, we put out the same amount of energy. However, a very small number, we get a change in energy, and that allows us to take Raman data. So in this case, this plot in the right, the bottom here, is um, an Stokes data from Raman spectra. So that starts to now tell us about the vibrational behavior of our materials. Now, I really am gonna go left a little bit here. What I want you to see from here is that, actually, this is all just data, and I'm sure all the computational sci computer scientists out there don't really matter what the data's of. So this is actually of makeup. So I have a PhD student who's been looking at, looking at the possibility of discriminating between makeup. And you can see that that actually isn't a huge step away from discriminating a healthy from a non-healthy sample. So what we have here is five repeats of um, what is Olivia Hale Cafe O Late Foundation. Um, and you can see that we largely get the same spectrum and that we can then identify the peaks to belong in to particular spectrum, to particular components. We can then start to look across the board. So obviously her interest is, can I discriminate a sample I found at a crime scene from a sample I have taken from a suspect, et cetera, and can I tell if they match? So what we've done here, or what she's done here, is she's looked at the different components, and we can start to pull out differences between some of them. This is very much the one she sees the differences between. We see an awful lot that are almost identical. Unsurprisingly, makeups put the same things in all of their components into all of their systems. We then moved into chemometrics, and what we're now looking at is the variability between our sample. So if we have multiple spectra, can we tell the difference between or where on what level are the differences are? And this, for us, this is sort of the precursor to artificial intelligence machine learning. So what we've actually got here is that largely for the makeup set, we can see that we can segregate them into either rutile or anatase type titanium dioxide. And then we have this grouping down here that we're wondering if it's actually a foundation or if it's a different type of cream, it clearly contains something different. So then we have over here is our principal component analysis. And this is important because what this is now starting to look at is where and on what level that variability is. And we can take this systematically through principal component one, principal component two, up to a point where you almost see a flat line where you've no longer got any variability. And that's important because what that means is if you can start to track the variability, you can start to identify where it comes from. And the bottom plots here are just some cluster plots that allow us to start to put this into three-dimensional space. And actually, when you look at it like this, we find it very hard to discriminate between our samples beyond clustering. So from a forensic point of view, not so good for actually matching, although we would be able to tell you if it belonged to this family or this family. Uh, one of the key things I'd like also for you to take home is there was a question earlier about how much data is enough data. 
And this is a question that we also have. So this was 305 spectra that we took here across 61 samples, and the clustering is a slightly smaller step. You can actually see that there's a relationship when we were looking through the literature, there's a relationship between confidence interval and how confident you can be that something is the same or something has a variance to it. It's sort of like this. So at some point, there is a point where having more data doesn't help. What that point is, I'm not sure. So that led us into uh, looking a little bit more securities. This is actually taken from Hariba. But actually, with Raman now, we can start to get limits of detection and quantification. So up until fairly recently, we thought about Raman as a technique to measure spectral information. But actually, now we can start to use it to get limits of detection. If you go into the Raman quiet region, this is much easier. This is um, paracetamol, so uh, in, in HCL. I wanted to show here some of our sports doping data, but the student project student I had last year didn't save it in any format that I can interrogate it. So I took this one instead. So this led us naturally on to thinking about, well, what work is out there for Raman with biomarkers? Some of this was driven by our interest in, we've been putting prednisolone into blood samples to look for steroids and, and things like that. So we came to this sort of work, and we found this actually there's an enormous body of work out there on Raman and checking for biomarkers. The interesting thing is there's not a lot of coupling that with either chemometrics or AI, and in often cases, any volume of data. So quite often we found it would be 10 self-diagnosed healthy patients, 10 patients with a particular disease, and they're looking at the variability in the spectra. So this is from some work we found from here. This is a healthy patient. This is an Alzheimer patient. This is a patient with some other form of dementia. And they believe they can see the difference between them visually. Now, I've spent a long time, and I swear I can't. But this led us to think, well, actually, is there subtleties we can pull out? What can we pull out of Raman data? Of what use could it be? So we started with a number of questions. Firstly, what is the general variability? If you measure the blood five minutes after it's come out, is it different from after it's been taken somewhere else, transported to your lab? What happens if it's been in the fridge a few days? What happens if I ate something particularly spicy last night? What happens if I'm a smoker? What is the just general variability? If you're going to develop a model, we need to know the variability. We're also looking at this small variability, so we need a better way of looking at that. And I've also put here biomarker or metabolite. Effectively, with Raman, what we're looking at is spectral vibration. Um, this is tau protein, and this is a drug that's used to treat Alzheimer. And they are very different, but actually, what biomarker, are biomarkers distinct when you're looking at them on this level, on a spectral level? Can we really see the difference? Or is, are we seeing the drug? If you have 10 patients that are all have the same diagnosis, they also potentially also, also have the same treatment pattern. So are you detecting something you could detect early, or are you detecting their treatment pattern? So that led us to this project. We started to chat with a clinician at Kent and, Kent and Canterbury Hospital, and he's um, kidney transplantation and acute kidney injury is the area he works in. And please forgive me if I get any of this wrong. Detecting kidney failure is very difficult. You only start to pick up the biomarkers by conventional testing once they're already failing. Right? You're already into a treatment that is going to mean dialysis and probably transplantation. After transplantation, the kidney may fail for a number of reasons. Drug toxicity, rejection, the drug used only has a narrow window, or uh, effectively a, a viral infection. It's very difficult to detect without biopsy which one of these you're dealing with, but the treatment is dependent on knowing which one you're dealing with. So, okay, can we start to look 
at these and can we see differences in these? And then this can lead to bespoke treatment that is for the patient without a biopsy. So what we have is a project to look at this. We have two plans. One is to do some lab-based variability and one is to do some clinical-based stuff. We will get blood samples. Blood samples are taken from the patients routinely, weekly anyway. So we're hoping that we can just piggyback onto their routine blood tests, which will actually give us a way to monitor. We are not the ones checking that they're healthy. That will still be the clinicians. But we will also have that information that if we see changes, and they've also detected changes, we can actually start to correlate that. We'll then look at some basic chemometrics to look at the variability. And then we'll look at AI to develop methodologies to be able to say, OK, this is, this is what we're seeing. Is this a yes or a no? And then that brings us back to looking at this subtle variability and understanding what's happening. I just wanted to quickly show you this video in my last minute. Raman is normally a really big instrument. This is our little handheld instrument. It is completely portable, not much bigger than your mobile phone, and really doesn't require much in the way of running. <laughs> so this is our vial attachment, so it's running in a safe manner. No, no laser training required. We also have an attachment that allows us to put effectively little strips in, which we can also impregnate with gold nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles to make it SIRS. And then voila, up pops your data. So it's a, a really quick process. We can manage those really quickly. So we think there's a lot of power in Raman spectroscopy. We just need to study it a bit more carefully. But there are problems associated with these types of analyses. And we need to be careful that we are not adding to those, but that we're interpreting them. And that's what our project's hoping. We're hoping to start January 1st, because we're in the process of doing ethics to be able to get the hospital parts through. We have a team who are responsible for different aspects of it. The forensic work was done by these guys. And we're very grateful to the Future Blood Testing Network for enabling us to get our feet wet in this area, which is something we've not done before. And thank you for listening.